Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Capizzi. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Human Ecology at Catholic University. I'm also a professor in the School of Theology and Religious Studies. It's my pleasure uh, to have you guys with us this afternoon to talk about uh, Angela Knobel's book, Aquinas and the Infused Moral Virtues. I want to thank Bill Madison for allowing us to post that up there right now on the screen. Um, this is really exciting for us uh, at the Institute. One of the things that we try to do is promote uh, and focus on you know, real scholarship and Angela a former Catholic University uh, professor uh, in philosophy, is really a top-notch scholar, really first-rate work uh, in Thomism and in particular in virtue theory. Uh, she received her doctorate in philosophy from the University of Notre Dame, that's a common theme here, uh, in 2004. Her work focuses primarily on Aquinas' theory of infused virtues, virtue ethics, and applied ethics. Currently, she's teaching philosophy at the uh, University of Dallas, and this book that we're focusing on today was published uh, by the University of Notre Dame Press, when, this year, or 21? Mm -hmm. yeah. 21, fantastic. It, my notes say forthcoming. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the rare times where forthcoming has actually produced the thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Bill Madison, whose laugh you just heard, uh, completed his doctoral studies at the University of Notre Dame uh, as well. I did too, so that makes three of us up here. <laughs> Uh, four, excuse me, uh, uh, four, oh geez, all four of us did, that's right. I, you know, I saw the Cambridge thing, and I was like, why did I get that wrong? Um, uh, he spent two years as visiting assistant professor at Notre Dame and another two at Mount St. Mary's in, Emmons, in Emmicksburg before joining us, before I was able to swindle him into coming and joining us here at Catholic University for about a decade. Um, he returned to Notre Dame in 2016 with a joint appointment as Wilsey Family Associate Professor in the Department of Theology as well as Senior Advisor for the Theological Formation in the Alliance for Catholic Education, or the ACE program, at Notre Dame. David Elliott, um, the third of our panelists to have his degree from the University of Notre Dame, uh, came to Catholic, Univer Catholic University in 2017 after a three-year postdoc at Cambridge University. He completed his doctoral studies in 2014. All of us studied under Gene Porter uh, at Catholic University, um, a, a, a renowned Thomist and wonderful, wonderful Dr. Mutter, um, which you don't hear much, except for Angela, that's right. Uh, Dr. Elliott has taught widely within moral theology at Cambridge and Notre Dame, uh, and as well here at Catholic University. By the way, somewhere in this room, maybe it's on the back, uh, the back there is a thing with one of these things uh, on it, one of these little, and if you, I guess if you do something with that, you can get 40% 40 40 off of Angela's book. And I do encourage you to do it because the book is really wonderful. And if you care about these things, as probably most of you do since you're here, um, hers is the kind of book that you'd actually can, you know, profit from, teach from, you know, learn from for your own studies. So do take advantage of this technology to get 40% off of the book. I am out of your hair from this point on. Angela will, will kick us off. I think Bill is gonna speak. David is going to speak next and then Bill, and then they will have a conversation among themselves and open it to your questions. So again, thank you for, thank you for coming. Do you want a second time or Thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, it feels like home coming on campus because in some sense it, it really is home. My, um, I first started here as an undergraduate in 1993, my very first philosophy professor ever sitting right in the front row and another shortly following also sitting in the front row. Um, so, and you know, I recognize many of you. I have my former colleagues here who are also probably some of the, both, um, some of the, uh, have the most expertise of anybody I could kind of hope to talk about these subjects with. And um, so I'm, I, this is a really fun, this is a really fun experience here. Um, I've, been, I've been working on this book um, in one form or another for a very, very long time. I used to think, you know, I reread Middlemarch a couple years ago and I was like, I am Mr. Casabon. That's, <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm just so happy. Um, I'm happy that it's that it's finished. I want to talk about 
a little bit about why, uh, what the book is about and why I think it's so interesting. Um, and then I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure of the book and the, the argument that gets made there. I'm not as sophisticated as uh, either David or Bill. I'm nowhere near as sophisticated as Bill, so I don't have a PowerPoint like he does. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to read, but I'll try to make eye contact while I do that. <laughs> Aquinas, so Aquinas recognizes two different kinds of moral virtue. The first, which is the kind described by Aristotle, is ordered to our natural fulfillment. So like Aristotle, Aquinas held that we can cause virtues in ourselves ordered to our natural fulfillment through our own repeated good acts. But Aquinas also recognized a second kind of moral virtue, namely moral virtues that enable us to act in a manner proportionate to the one end that truly fulfills us, namely heavenly beatitude. Since we can't act in a manner proportionate to heavenly beatitude through our own power, Aquinas held that these latter virtues are necessarily bestowed by God. The former are typically referred to as natural or acquired virtues, and the latter as infused or supernatural virtues. Since infused moral virtues order us to the one perfection that is truly the goal of the Christian moral life, they are, of course, the most important. But they also get the least press. So broad overviews of Aquinas' moral theory, especially the, the kind um, published between, I don't know, 1900 and 19, the late 1990s, often omit mention of the infused moral virtues altogether, giving the impression that Aquinas thought the goal of the Christian moral life was to cultivate Aristotelian virtues that are somehow crowned or redirected by the theological virtues. When I was in graduate school, which is an increasingly long time ago, it was not at all uncommon to find scholars, even Thomas, who were unaware that Aquinas even posited infused moral virtues. Others acknowledged them but dismissed them. Um, I, I had a professor once tell me that Aquinas, for Aquinas, the infused moral virtues are just totally ad hoc. Right? He included them because the tradition mentioned them, but he didn't really care about them. Right? Um, <laughs> But Aquinas clearly does think the infused virtues are important and importantly different from Aristotelian natural virtues. At the same time, though, Aquinas is frustratingly vague. He insists that the moral virtues that order us to heavenly beatitude are necessarily infused. But when you go and look at Aquinas' text, it can be very difficult to determine whether a given textual reference to virtue is a reference to infused virtue or to its acquired counterpart or whether it is intended to refer to them both. He typically refers simply to virtue, even when an examination of the surrounding text reveals that he must be referring exclusively to one kind or the other. And even more frustratingly, he says almost nothing at all about how the two kinds of virtue are related. Other scholars have plenty to say about how they think Aquinas thought the infused and acquired virtues are related, but that's frustrating too, um, because when you go and look at the footnotes, when there are footnotes, they often cite a scholar of Aquinas, and when you go look at their footnotes, they often cite another scholar of Aquinas, and when it does end in a text, it's hard to see how the text generates the claim, right? So, so this is what makes it, um, the question so interesting. Um, so in this book, I attempt to shed some light on the infused moral virtues, on what they are, on why Aquinas thought they mattered, and on the role they play in the Christian moral life. And the book has roughly two parts. Okay? The first part, the first three chapters, is concerned with the details of Aquinas' text. In that first part, I have two goals. The first goal is to offer a clear account of how, for Aquinas, the infused and acquired virtues, for lack of a better word, work. The second goal is to examine what, if anything, Aquinas actually commits himself to regarding the question of the relationship between the infused and acquired virtues. And then in the second part, I examine the major theories of the relationship between the virtues against the framework I outline in the first part. And finally, of course, I offer a theory of my own. 
Okay, so I'm just going to say a little bit about um, each of the, a little bit more about each of those two parts. So the central claim of the first two chapters is that Aquinas's Aristotelian account of acquired virtue provides the framework or the scaffolding, if you will, for his account of infused virtue. It is very much the case that for Aquinas, grace builds on and perfects nature. But it does so, I argue, in a much more fundamental way than one might at first imagine. It is not merely, as some broad overviews of Aquinas imply, that grace takes Aristotelian virtue and redirects it, but that grace transforms the very principles that order us to virtue themselves. Like Aristotle, Aquinas thinks that our nature provides us with both an end and the capacity to pursue it. But Aquinas is more specific than Aristotle about what that capacity consists of. Aquinas says that we can cause moral virtues in ourselves because we possess the following three things. First, an inchoate knowledge of what our natural fulfillment is. Second, reason, which enables us, at least in principle, to render that vague knowledge specific. And finally, passion susceptible to reason's formation, which, when rightly formed, actually assist reason in its deliberation. Since the capacities that enable us to cultivate the natural virtues are tied in an intimate way with nature itself, Aquinas maintains that a change in end such as that which occurs when we receive through sanctifying grace and order to supernatural beatitude must be accompanied by a change in our natural principles themselves. Since our, not natural, since our knowledge of the natural law provides us with our initial ordering to our natural fulfillment, Aquinas maintains that we need some kind of similar ordering to our supernatural fulfillment. Thus, he argues consistently and repeatedly throughout his corpus that the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love do at the supernatural level what the habitual knowledge of first principles of the natural law does at the natural level. But the theological virtues, while more perfect, are less perfectly possessed. Consequently, reason cannot move from the inchoate knowledge given by faith, hope, and love without help. And so Aquinas maintains that in order to render the general knowledge given by the theological virtues specific in action, we need additional divine help. We need the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are divinely given habits that enable us to receive the Holy Spirit's prompting. Finally, while at the natural level, our repeated good acts simply cause corresponding appetitive inclinations, Aquinas maintains that at the supernatural level, the requisite appetitive inclinations must themselves be given by God. Okay, so that's the argument of the first two chapters. Uh, it, it should be clear, even from that very broad description, that Aquinas thinks infused and acquired virtues do two very different kinds of things, that each serves a different purpose. So, of course, the question is, what's the relationship? How are the two kinds of virtue related? In the third chapter, I argue that in spite of great, the great many claims that are attributed to Aquinas, Aquinas actually says very little, that what he does say changes over time, and that the one theory most consistently implied by Aquinas, and consistent is really a stretch here, right? There's only two or three sentences in, across all of Aquinas' writings where he implies something about the relationship between the infused and acquired virtues. But uh, if, you, if you take the, and, and two of the three kind of imply something that I think is unsatisfactory. So it's not, it's not a lot, right? Um, so if Aquinas doesn't provide an ant, a resolution to the question, then another option, of course, is to consider other people's solutions. And so in chapters four and five, I address contemporary attempts to offer a Thomistic account of the relationship between the infused and acquired virtues. And I divide the existing solutions into two categories, right? One that proposes that the Christian cultivates both infused and acquired virtues um, that are separate, right? Um, that's chapter four. And 
then the interpretation that argues that the infused and acquired virtues in the Christian form some kind of unity, okay? So that a single virtuous Christian act somehow consists of both. That's chapter five. And I argue, as you might expect, that both solutions are problematic. I think the first solution compartmentalizes the Christian moral life, implying that it is only sometimes necessary to act in a manner proportionate to supernatural beatitude. The various versions of the second solution, on the other hand, can't accommodate either Aquinas' clear assertions about how the infused and acquires, acquired virtues differ, or his clear belief that the infused virtues can operate fully and well in the absence of their acquired counterparts. So what's the solution? I argue that there is a way of understanding the respective roles of the infused and acquired moral virtues that is consistent with both Aquinas' Aristotelian foundation, with his explicit remarks about the differences between infused and acquired moral virtues, and his Christian commitments. First, given Aquinas' repeated claim that only infused moral virtues can produce acts proportionate to supernatural beatitude, I argue that the practice and cultivation of the infused moral virtues is the sole coherent goal of the Christian moral life. It doesn't make sense to claim that it is only sometimes appropriate to cultivate infused moral virtues or that we should deliberately cultivate dispositions ordered to our natural as opposed to our supernatural perfection. At the same time, however, even assuming that we do make the practice and cultivation of the infused virtues our goal, we cannot know that we have hit our mark. And most of us, even if we're trying, will frequently fall short. So I argue that when we fall short of the goal, right, when, when in spite of our best efforts, we fail to perform an act of infused virtue, we will end up performing something that looks very like an act of acquired virtue. So long as our goal is the cultivation of infused virtue, then I think it is reasonable to believe that such acts could indeed dispose to growth in the Christian moral life. But if the opposite happens, if capable of acting in a manner befitting our divine inheritance, we nonetheless content ourselves with the pursuit of the virtues solidly within our grasp, then I think we fail to live up to our Christian calling and dispose ourselves to moral atrophy rather than moral improvement. That's, that's what I argue in the book. Okay, well, it's such a, a thrill, really, and an honor to be here. Um, I have to say, Angela's work is um, just such a, a, a powerful field-changing body. Uh, and this has been true since I was a grad student and all of us were reading her and there was a kind of excitement to it, like she wasn't just rehashing old tired theses, but it actually broke a new ground. And this particular book, I think it's, it's one a lot of us have been waiting for for about a decade. It's just such a culmination <laughs> of all this work. Um, <laughs> and, and so along with Bill Madison, who's here with her today, I think she's very much been read by all of us as the essential go-to person on this subject. And this book will just make it even more so the case. And it's also just as a book, I would say, just a model of lucidity. It's short. I mean, this could easily be 400 pages, but it's something like 130. Um, it's something you'd assign in a doctoral seminar or with other graduate students, but it's something also I think any reasonably intelligent Christian who's just interested in the moral life could pick up. So it's just an, a remarkable achievement on so many levels. Uh, but what I want to do in my remarks is uh, single out what I think are two major contributions uh, from this work that I think are really field-changing apart from even the specific debate about whether you can have inquired and infused virtues at the same time. So something everybody can take away with this. And then I'll just ask three questions. So one's just a brief question of clarification about what Aquinas actually thinks, you know, the mens auctoris, the minds of the author. And then two more substantive questions, which effectively amount to how radical is this proposal when we work it out in detail concretely? Um, so they're more like 
questions of implication, but I think they also have some nature grace implications as well. So first contribution, as I see it, and you could just pick out really dozens out of this work. I think Angela has really persuasively shown that the infused virtues do function as virtues in every way you need them to. So just to give one example, Aristotle and Aquinas both say that doing the right thing, but you know, with gritted teeth and fevered brow, doing the thing characteristically with great difficulty is a mark or symptom, not of virtue, but of continence. Uh, and so Aquinas raises this at various points. He says the second habit or nature, virtues generally confer ease, promptness, and pleasure, the facility thesis. Uh, this facility isn't essential for virtue, but it is a characteristic feature. And when Aquinas gets into this subject, he sometimes brings this up as at least a problem he has to address. So if you look back over these Thomistic commentaries, going back a good 600 years, what does everybody do when they look at this debate? They immediately make it a facility debate. Uh, and so when looking at why somebody who already had infused virtues why might they need acquired moral virtues, the cardinal uh, infused virtues? The typical answer is you need those to give you facility. Uh, and a standard example is the alcoholic who converts, he enters a state of grace. He has infused temperance, so he's able to do those matters necessary for salvation, but he lacks acquired temperance and therefore doesn't have facility, doesn't have that ease, promptness, and pleasure. But this is deeply unsatisfactory, I think, uh, because it views infused virtue as operating rather like continence, just intractably, uh, with no possibility of ever shaping the appetites, the passions, and forming us in a way we expect of virtue. And so what this did is I think it left a kind of flank open where a lot of critics came along and said, well, if that's the best we can expect of infused virtues, what good are they? Why not just call this continence? And so people, you know, from Dun Scotus up to Odon Lautan have been arguing that it's a superfluous thesis. But I think what Angela has shown is this facility question isn't the real issue at all. And insofar as it does matter, which Aquinas does think, she's helped show that infused virtues really do shape the powers and appetites and can produce facility even if not at the outset, which Aquinas concedes. Uh, and so in this way, it's, it's very much a persuasive account of how the infused virtues function fully as virtues, and they don't need, as it were, the acquired virtues to bail them out. So I think this is an essential contribution. Second one is that I think Angela has shown that Aquinas' own focus in the moral life is very much on the, acquire, on the infused virtues, both theological an infused cardinal and that she's helped bury the idea that the infused moral virtues are only needed for a few acts related to salvation in some narrowly understood sense. I think in light of her work, not just this book, but uh, more generally, this thesis can't be seriously held. And it's quite interesting because it changes the entire tone of the moral life and moral theology. It shifts uh, our attention more to God, to grace, to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so I think it's important that in Angela's work, we've decisively seen overcome the idea that Aquinas is in effect Aristotle baptized. So that alone has been a major achievement and conversation changer in the field. And I think that within moral theology specifically, Angela's work addresses a lot of the concerns of people like Stanley Hauerwas, Alistair McIntyre, Survey Pinkairs from the 70s and 80s, that Christian ethics as a discipline had gotten too vague, had gotten in way too Kantian, didn't have the kind of Christian particularity that people were looking for. So what Angela has done is not just say, yes, we need that, but in effect done the deep dive that shows us what that looks like in sophisticated detail. Okay, so first a question of clarification. This is about what does Aquinas think? So Angela says on, this is page 105, when we consider all of Aquinas's texts together, I think the best we can say is that Aquinas appears to lean toward the view that the Christian possesses and cultivates both infused and acquire moral virtues and that both are operative in distinct arenas of the Christian moral life. And I think that's really admirable that there's no fudges here. There's no attempt at pure revisionism. In terms of the mind of the author, I think that's accurate. 
So as far as I understand, what Angela then wants to do is, is distinguish Aquinas' stated views, which are very few, but when he actually says, he, in effect, here's how I think the two relate, from his structural or overall views, which she thinks favor her thesis. It's a little bit like if the father of the family dies and he has his best suit and everybody's wondering who it goes to. In his will, he says, seemingly it goes to the youngest son whom it doesn't fit at all whereas everyone expected it to go to the eldest son whom it fits perfectly. And so the family's left saying, well, who should it really go to? And I think Angela's conclusion is it should go to the place it fits. But I'm a little bit unclear about the precise claim. So suppose we grant the point that nobody has yet shown how Aquinas' stated views, as, we, as far as we can reconstruct them, make sense. Is the further idea supposed to be that Aquinas himself just got this one wrong? or that he just needed someone to make better sense of him than he could make of himself. That of course could be true, but it's rather awkward. It's a bit like saying the founders built better than they knew. And I'm generally un unclear, however, since most of Angela's refutations are not of Aquinas on the subject of whether these virtues coexist, but rather of what other scholars have said in trying to say, here's how it all plays out. Okay, and then I have two substantive questions of implication in terms of the tangible form this is going to take. So first question is, what will the focus on infused virtue look like in practice? One thing I like about Angela's work is that she doesn't blunt Aquinas' radical edges. Aquinas' standard example of the difference between these two virtues is that acquired virtue implies a temperance, say, of moderate eating or drinking, like you'd find in Aristotle, whereas infused temperance implies, quote, that a man castigate his body by abstaining from food, drink, and the like, unquote. And his other examples of infused moral virtue actions, what they actually look like, tend to have a rather ascetic quality. He names things like fasting, abstinence, martyrdom, virginity, and so forth. And there are, of course, counterexamples. You're going to feast on feast days, but overall, there's a rather ascetic flow of traffic. I mean, I think of Alistair McIntyre's statement that the saint is from the viewpoint of the balanced Aristotelian, likely to look like an extremist or a fanatic. So Angela doesn't dodge this point, and if we look at a Dominican life in Aquinas's context, for instance, as laid out in Humbert of Romans, it's clear that Aquinas himself signed up for a deeply ascetic life, including, for instance, no meat ever, fasting from September 14th till Easter Sunday, uh, with one meal a day and then a little bit of thin soup in the evening. Uh, almost every night, three-hour prayer vigils, so matins and lauds would last, it's been estimated, three hours, and the friars would get up for that at midnight, and even taking the discipline, for those of you who know what that means, after Compline. So his references to infused virtue castigating the body are hardly token. They evoke a whole way of life that I think he and the Dominicans actually lived. And it's important to point out, of course, as Leonard Boyle has argued, that the target audience of the Summa itself is almost certainly young Dominican juniores, Dominican younger students. And I think even Aquinas' sermons to lay people have that quality in modified form. So my question is, if the Christian moral life should be all infused all the time, Angela, do you think the Christian life is going to have, with some nuances, a rather sharper ascetic quality to it? This could be interesting, and it could actually bring Aquinas much closer to much other medieval theology and to virtually all patristic theology, which presupposes a central role for asceticism. So it's a kind of resourcement possibility. And then my final question is, what might be some of the social or even political implications of Angela's thesis? So one thing that attracts a lot of people to the other position, to the idea that you have acquired and infused virtues at the same time, is that if you take that position, it looks like Christians can have their own kind of justice, but also share a sort of justice that the world generally recognizes. For example, one interlocutor, David DiCosimo, very much likes the idea that in the civil rights movement, you've got Christians and non-Christians marching side by side and working together for a shared vision of justice. Sure, Christians don't share infused justice with unbelievers, or at least except for anomalous cases, but maybe we can aim at acquired justice together, perhaps often under the label social justice. And it's not just a legal fiction. We can really possess this virtue and that common good together. 
But if Christians in grace can't have acquired virtue, then in general it looks like the acquired virtues are virtues for non-Christians. A really strong sense of them is pagan virtue. In other words, we're never going to aim at the same justice or the same common good. We may be, relative to non-believers, doomed to mutual incomprehension and alienation. Now, to soften this, of course, it's true that acquired justice is definitely analogous to infused justice. Otherwise, they wouldn't both be called justice. So it's not like having different justices entails total conflict in our aims. But I think at the same time, Angela pointedly suggests that the mean of acquired and infused virtue may conflict with each other. She says this at several points, so that you'd have virtue conflicting with virtue. That raises interesting nature question, uh, grace questions of its own. But just on this issue, it seems that we might be stuck with significant conflict, even with virtuous non-believers, let alone vicious ones. So in big picture terms, does this mean the church is doomed to be in serious conflict or tension with the wild, wider world, even at its best? And does that leave the goals of Vatican II, for example, looking a bit naive and many feeling quite demoralized? Just to clarify, if the church world tensions <clears throat> aren't going to be this extreme, I'd be interested to hear why not and how we should think of this relation. I'd also like to hear whether, even apart from some political questions this might raise, Angela's account does entail at least a significant loss of shared vision and purpose between Christians and non-Christians because we're never going to be working for the same justice. Anyway, those are my questions, but they're questions from someone who's admired her work for years as really game-changing and sees this book as probably the most, one of the most interesting bodies of work in the last half century. So in a very important way, I think the book will be the latest word in Thomistic virtue theory and our basic go-to in the field for all questions related to the virtues. Thanks. Oh, look, there's a screen here. All right, thank you all for being here. And it really is a pleasure to serve with not just two great colleagues in the field um, with whom I share just great conversations on these matters, but also two great friends. So, um, and thanks, Joe, for having us here at the Institute. Um, where am I going here? Aha. Let's get this out. <coughs> All right. Um, so let me pick up where David left off there and just say this about the book. I mean, I, I'll just say it directly, and I, I absolutely think it's true. Um, this is the best book out there right now on Thomas on Virtue, and not just like recently and because of a timely argument. Um, if you want to have a good exposure to Thomistic thought on virtue, this is the best book, you know, um, period. I mean, obviously, besides Thomas's text. Um, I might have said when I first was writing something about this, I think it was the blurb for the back of it, I said, you know, we have a new Klubertans. And I, I was formed on that you know, Klubertans book in, I think, 1962, Habit and Virtue. And then, frankly, I went back and read that and engaging this book, and I thought it was just so much better. I didn't even say that. Um, so th this is really, it's that good of a book. So I share Joe's uh, encouragement to, to read it. And I will also say uh, what a pleasure it is to be here with David, too. But Angela, I, there's not something I write on this topic that I don't run by Angela. And she's always very generous to read it, as is David. So um, anyway, there's no one's judgment who I trust more on these things. So here's my task here. Um, oops, sorry, where does that work? There you go. Three tasks. What is Angela doing here? We'll do that real quick because we've already done that. What are some of her key claims? We're going to see some commonality with David and also what claims warrant further discussion. The polite way of saying, you know, what criticisms are there. But to be honest, I, this is um, in my opinion. I don't know if Angela would agree. I, I, feel like I kind of agree with virtually everything she says. I mean, any differences we have are kind of like arguing with your little brother, you know? Um, there's so much in common that it kind of grounds that, that um, those differences, which are not insignificant, but I think are properly situated, um, relatively small. So what is she doing here? Three things I see. I mean, as she mentioned in chapters four to six, the telos of the book is an argument about the relationship between the acquired and infused virtues in the same person is a key point here, right? This is not an argument about pagan virtue. Um, 
And, uh, you know, typical Angela, whether it be analyzing the text of Aquinas or narrating the different positions in the field, she just kind of slices through it with great precision. Chapter four, arguing for one kind of perspective over here. Chapter five, for another perspective over here. And of course, there she is in chapter six, right in the middle. Um, I actually, this is one thing I do want to um, poke at a little bit, your narration of the four, five, six, but we'll get to that at the very end. Um, but really what she does, as she mentioned in one, two, and three, which is exactly what's needed, is a, a structural account of virtue. What the heck are the virtues? I have to say that uh, as someone who writes in this area, the language of virtue is used enormously imprecisely in the fields. You know, people talk about virtues as if they're kind of good ideas or values, or sometimes they speak of them as agents, like prudence does this. And there's a lot of really poor ways that people speak about virtue. They kind of reify them as if they're artifacts in us, you know, I gained um, prudence. So th there's a lot of uh, imprecision out there. And Angela's book is phenomenal um, in kind of presenting in chapter one, a natural account of virtue. And to my point three here, showing the difference everybody always talks about and is absolutely true. And she rightly accentuates it because it's very true. The world of grace is a whole nother world as David's points mentioned, but also the really important continuity in line with the scholastic dictum that grace perfects nature. So that's what she does in the book is this, um, address both that continuity and difference. All right, some of the key claims, I'm gonna give you five. Um, she basically claims that virtues supply particular ends. She doesn't word it this way, I do, So I, I'm, but she, I wouldn't have been able to do it without um, Angela's thought. So let me see if I can speak about these three levels. You know, the, the human person, any creature, but we'll talk about the human person here, has a nature and by which he or she is oriented to certain ends of activity. The tradition speaks of this using the natural inclinations. The ends, in a sense, are already possessed in the creature, in the person, whereby they're oriented towards certain types of activity. But of course, at that level, at the natural level, um, the, the ends are very inchoate, they're indeterminate, particularly in the rational person. So what we have before that third level there on the right of activity, which is the creature actualizing those inchoate potentialities um, and activities that, um, if they're in line with the creature's nature, are constitutive of flourishing. What you have in between there is qualities or features of the person whereby they're more underdetermined ends supplied by nature are rendered more particular. So you have a kind of, by nature, a, you know, inclination toward eating and it's not toward rust, it's toward food. But yet, because of the culture you grew up in and the family you grew up with and, and a whole set of things, the decisions you've made through the grace of God, you eat kind of with a general appetitive inclination towards certain types of food and certain amounts and with certain nutritious abilities and what, uh, or qualities. And that habit kind of adheres in your natural eating ability so that it further particularizes that, that ends toward which you're oriented from the perspective of the acting person. An end which then can be actualized if you act in accordance with the virtue in more specific determinate manners or not. So virtues neither determine nor necessitate specific activity, but incline one toward that. Her treatment of the virtues as supplying particular ends, I think as well as anything out there in the field, explains that process and what virtues get you, so to speak as qualities or habits that kind of rest in between a person and his or her acts. So great, great ad there. Second one, and this is continuing from her dissertation for those of you who know it, um, you know, the field influenced by Aquinas is very good at recognizing the important difference that grace makes at the level of nature, at the level of habit, that's what we're talking about here with the theological virtues and the infused moral virtues, but also the importance of the, uh, the necessity of grace to even act out of virtues once they are processed by God's grace. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit, those habits, level two, whereby we're rendered amenable to acting through the operative grace of God, level three, in a manner that's constitutive of our supernatural flourishing. That's what the, the, the gifts provide. And her account of the gifts is splendid in kind of delineating um, th their role, which is too often kind of inchoate in the field today. She also, also kind of further solidifies a stand she had taken in her dissertation that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not kind of occasional sporadic movements in the life of grace but are, are constant and continually needed. Um, we may not always live according to them through venial sin or even mortal sin, but nonetheless, they're not kind of, you know, wind in the sails that appears periodically to use the John of St. Thomas analogy. So anyway, her work is a great contribution on that level. Um, David mentioned this, but she also uh, provides uh, a great argument of how the virtues, including the infused virtues, require ongoing growth. 
you know, there's a common, David mentioned this, but there's a common assumption that, you know, particularly given our belief in infant baptism, between uh, stories of conversion, that the infused virtues can be possessed all of a sudden, and then any growth that happens is kind of the backfilling that's provided, some people posit wrongly, the acquired cardinal virtues. Um, Angela rightly insists that, no, the infused virtues themselves are amenable to growth. If you've ever read Aquinas' disputed question on, on charity, for instance, with those great couple articles, I think it's uh, 8 and 9 or 9 and 10, um, people look at Secunda, Secunda 24, 9 a lot, which is very brief, but you really want to look at these disputed questions on this. It's a beautiful account of the necessity of ongoing growth in charity in the Christian life. So really, she's not only saying, hey, look, that's important and needed, She's saying that, look, don't, sub, don't posit the uh, acquired virtues as kind of doing that work. It actually happens within the context of the infused virtues. In my opinion, totally right. Um, and as David mentioned, which I won't belabor, um, growth in virtue is not wholly, or even I would say primarily, I think she would agree, um, by greater facility of action. I might say greater facility of action is a greater component of growth in virtue maybe than you would. Um, but the primary intensio or intensification of virtue happens to the greater degree that a virtue's activity is oriented toward the ends, toward what it's, it's directed. Um, so her fourth claim, which I think is another key ad in the field, um, I mean, we just talked about this, and it was the first of David's three questions, that Aquinas' texts are not as clear in the relationship between the acquired and infused virtues. That quote there at the bottom, I think, perfectly sums up her position, as does the quote that David read um, during his response. Is that the same one? No, it's a different one, but it makes the same point. Look, I confess I'm one of those people David referenced that because I agree with Angela and I think David that the broader structural account of Thomas's work on virtue necessitates the non-coexistence of infused and acquired virtues, I kind of read his couple of sentences of scattered texts like it can't be saying that. And Angela's kind of convinced me, man, if you had to throw your die, they kind of do. And really only two of them. I'm, I'm a little less amenable to the disputed question article 10, um, reply 4 interpretation you offer as like um, supporting that view in Thomas. But I think the two questions from the, the, the two citations from the sentences, I, I think you're totally right. I mean, he says that. Um, we could talk more about why in response to your first one uh, afterwards. I have some thoughts on that. Um, anyway. And, and, and I, I like the fact that Angela, in that middle line there, you know, rightly subordinates the question of the right interpretation of Aquinas. You know, what exactly does he say here to what's generally true? And for those of us who rely on Aquinas' thought, who trust that's more in line with the general thrust of his thought. Uh, last point there. Oh, did I skip one? That a formation and acquired virtue. Oh, this is David mentioned this point too. This is a, with unsurprisingly similar comments. Angela's, this is really innovative, and I've not seen this at all in the field before Angela's book, that formation in acquired virtue can actually serve as an impediment to formation in infused virtue. And I mean, I, I'm kicking, when I read this, I was like, gosh, of course. I mean, anybody who trusts Thomas's 63-4 claim that these, the, the formal object of the infused virtues differs from the formal object of the acquired virtues, it just has to be the case that if you're used to in the rich, robust sense, acting in a way that's commensurate with the acquired virtues, and that through a life of conversion or transformation of grace, then live toward a different end. Now, we'll have to talk about how they're continuous as well as different. We'll get to that later. Um, that there will be something impeding there. And that's why I think what David is rightly mentioning here. Wait a second. This, it's not so neat and smooth as you think. Um, which, of course, further lends credence to accounts of their relationship that articulate the infused virtues deploying the acquired. But, so let me get to um, claims warranting further discussion, um, all of which I think Angela's heard from me before. Angela does amazing work on the seeds of virtue, and she rightly emphasizes how for Aquinas, um, the theological virtues themselves are, are continually referenced as the seeds of virtue. This is blatantly true. Um, however, in line with that line we talked that vision earlier that maybe Angela doesn't agree with, I think when, we talk, when Thomas talks about seed, the natural principles of virtue at the level of seeds, he's talking about that left side there, you know, that nature, that what's supplied by nature. In fact, as Angela says, synderesis at the practical level. Um, the theological virtues are, of course, virtues, so therefore they're qualifications of the natural principles. They're not themselves the seeds. 
Now, so I, I think it's important to recognize Thomas's argument here that grace qualifies the essence of the soul kind of beneath, if you will, the virtues. Well, what about his persistence claim, as Angela very rightly recognizes, that the theological virtues are the seeds of the infused moral virtues? In my opinion, A, what he's doing there is recognizing that he can't put grace at the natural level for obvious reasons. It wouldn't be gratuitous and he would be Pelagian. Um, and secondly, um, the theological virtues can act as seeds providing the further ends as they do as virtues ordered toward God as last ends in relation to the infused moral virtues. So in other words, the virtues that orient us toward God as last end, the theological virtues, in relation to the infused moral virtues are like seeds. So I, I think that's why Thomas says that. Um, so I, I, you know, I could agree with Angela's read, but I do think we need to acknowledge that um, there's something else kind of beneath the, the, the natural powers that are qualified by the theological virtues, as I'm sure Angela would agree with, maybe not. But um, so anyway, that's the first point. The second point, this is the one that keeps coming up, it does formation uh, in acquired virtue ease your formation and infuse virtue. Now, I just made it as one of my points that this is one of the great assets of her book that she says, wait a second, these can be impediments. Well, um, so in, in, in one sense, she's right. No, it doesn't ease it. And I, this is like perhaps the summary of the book, this line on 156, that the cultivation of acquired virtues can never be the Christian's goal. And that is just absolutely right, in my opinion. Um, that should not be your goal in the Christian life, is the cultivation of um, acquired virtue. It's like you know, trying to be a mediocre husband. I, that's, that's, a, that's a bad analogy. Just take that back. Uh, you shouldn't think of things on the spot. Um, uh, but, um, but um, and also, you know, she says this great line on 163, that the moral virtues do not confer a sort of portable mental firmness that can be applied at will to any end whatsoever, you know, as if they were skills of some sort. Um, and that's just totally right. So she's right on that. However, um, I think sometimes she goes a little bit far on this point in saying um, on 164 that formation in acquired virtue has nothing at all to do with um, infuse virtue. Um, maybe you, should, you could look at that if you want to get the book to see if I'm reading that wrong, <laughs> as she's doing right now. Um, but I think it's a little bit overstated. Um, now, you might say, well, how could be it overstated if you've previously said that one of her assets is showing that it could be an impediment at times? Well, I think what we need here is sorting through the different types of habituation at the natural level. Vicious, which David referenced, obviously kind of steers one away toward, from the supernatural end. But there are ways, particularly at the sensory level, a topic I'll get to later, where the, the acquired virtues can dispose us in a manner that render us more amenable to the still always gratuitous infused virtues. Um, I would not only say that's true at the sensory level, I would say that, for instance, in our faith where we think like the goods of marriage are natural goods, the procreative and unitive, someone who through at the acquired natural level really robustly understood that, I would imagine it would be kind of an easier re-narration, a re-narration nonetheless to understand the sacramentality of marriage and the union between Christ and his church. But so still a re-narration that if you remain stuck in the natural would impede you from fully grasping the whole, but kind of an easier re-narration um, than, than would be if you were, for instance, you know, a, a philanderer. So I, and I think, of course, that's due to the continuity between the natural and supernatural ends. Not the sameness, not the, you know, but anyway. Um, so I, I want to have our cake and eat it too. I suspect Angela might too, although maybe she'll quibble with how I'm wording it. Um, so number three, um, I do think um, the book would benefit from a little bit more developed account of the dis distinction between habits and dispositions. It, it was actually in an early article of Angela's that I became aware of the importance of that distinction. So again, you're kind of seeing sibling, you know, kind of quibbling here. Um, but um, she does recognize accurately the habit dis disposition distinction, um, you know, briefly at times or it's kind of late in the argument. And I think we need more attention to the kind of sensory sources of specification of the ends of habits or dispositions as distinct from the rational. I think that would benefit here. Um, there are kind of hints at that when she talks about bodily dispositions on 38, in reference to non-rational in 177. So it, there's hints there, but um, in the absence of doing this, I, we get a couple problematic claims that 
For instance, it's possible for, quote, vicious habits to persist in the life of grace. I think I know what she means, and I would agree with it. What she means is ongoing contrary dispositions or relicta persist in the life of grace, not habits persist, because I know we agree they can't. But like in the absence of the habit disposition, disposition distinction, it's easier to be unclear. There's another point where she talks about habits becoming dispositions. And in the same way that we're going to see in a second, she rightly criticizes people for talking about um, how acquired virtues can become infused, which is wrong. I think we would also want to say that dispositions don't become habits. Um, so we can talk about that if we want. So I'm going to do the um, prideful thing of talking about Angela's engagement with my work. Because if, if you know the book, there's about six authors she deals with in a lot of detail. And I'm the one that gets the most pages. So I'm take, I'm, I think this is fair. Um, <laughs> And look, I'm, I'm basically going to say um, I, I learned three ways that, I mean, I'm wrong and she's right. So that's basically, so I want to like state those publicly. Um, so first of all, I know what I meant. I think Angela would agree with what I meant, but I didn't say that. In an early article on this, I continually claimed that the acquired virtues are transformed by grace. And what I was trying to get at there was that they attain a new form because of the 63-4 distinction between the formal object of the acquired versus infused being different. So that's what I meant. The problem with that language is it acts like that the acquired virtues themselves kind of persist as transformed. So really the way to word this, as Thomas himself does in the um, Disputed Questions on Virtue, it's not true that the boy becomes a man. The person who is a boy becomes a person who is a man. Now, you might say, like, I always see the boy in him. I knew Matt growing up, and I could still see that boy in him. But you really don't, right? You, you see the, man, the, the person he is who had been a boy, and now there's a person who is a man. So talk of, as I did wrongly, acquired virtues being transformed into infused one is actually wrong. Natural potencies that are qualified in a manner whereby we call them acquired virtues become requalified such that they are infused virtues. So anyway, so I was wrong on it. Um, and that's, I, I think, the, the main anchor in her argument why my account is problematic, which I think she's right on. Um, which at the end of the day, I actually view myself as agreeing with pretty much everything she says in her account. So I don't know if she would view that. But um, so, I mean, these are the reasons why she doesn't. And I'm basically saying she's right on all three. Um, the second error is that my claim that both virtues have the same material object what I meant to say, and Angela does say in her more careful analysis, is that infused temperance and acquired temperance have the same matter, or at times she says the same aspect. By saying material object, which she rightly notes kind of appears with Suarez, I created confusion by suggesting that um, there's something that kind of persists in the specification of the acquired virtue in the infused, and that's wrong. So I shouldn't have said material object. I just I should have said matter. So and again, number two, she's right on that. Number three is that um, I do this whole thing on living faith and dead faith and how they're different and similar. And Angela's always been wary of that, to be honest. This is like the one thing I've done that she's like, yeah, I don't think you have that right. I still think it's really um, illuminating for reasons I'm not going to get into now. But <laughs> in this book, she nails the fact of why it's a problematic. And she's right. Um, so I suggest that the object of both dead faith, I suggest that, um, basic analogy here, um, dead faith is to living faith as acquired virtue is to infuse virtue. There are about three or four reasons why that's true, which I won't get into now. A very important reason why it's not true is because the specification of the object of dead faith and living faith is the same, although not animated by charity whereas acquired virtue and infused virtue is not the specification of the same object. So that's why, so anyway, so that's right. I mean, she's right in that criticism. At the end of the day, um, I actually do think those things, um, while right, lead us kind of thinking the same way, but I'll let her speak to that. Last one is uh, kind of, uh, I think, kind of important. So the book basically has chapter four and chapter five narrating what she calls like people who cultivate both virtues separately that's chapter four, and people who have a unification view. And you can see the different people who think both those things, and those are the three sections of each of those chapters. I, th I don't actually think this is right, because, um, sorry, but the, um, I actually think that there's only one, I think there's two options here. You're either for or against coexistence. And I actually think that, you know, um, I think 
DeCosimo gets jammed in the latter one, even though he's really not that different from Boland, who's not only his teacher, but I think they both have an account of the infused virtues deploying the um, acquired ones. So, and I think Goris is actually kind of along the lines of a unif uh, so let's call it coexistence and non-coexistence. Coexistence would include Boland, Sherwin, Kent, I would say DeCosimo, and really on the other side, I would put Angela and me, I'm just trying to be with her here. Um, I do think Goris wants to be there too, but I, I, the criticisms she has of him are right, so I think it's a weak version of that. But I, I really, I, I think there's an X and not X here. I don't think there's like, you know, X, Z, and Y. Uh, and I don't know if you meant to portray it that way, but I kind of, um, I thought you were kind of portraying yourself in between those ones. I, I thought you kind of pulled out some from the other position to kind of create this one to put you in here. Um, so anyway. That's, that's uh, anything else? No, that's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I mean, it was, you're more generous than, than I um, could hope for or deserve, but I, I, really, uh, I really appreciate your very helpful comments. And I'll just, because I'm kind of narrow-minded and, and, and think in a linear fashion, I'll just respond to some of the things that David said and then respond to some of the things that Bill said. Um, so, um, but David asked, I think, a really interesting and important question. Like, why do I, you know, why focus on other people? What, you know, what did Aquinas, where did he, what did he get wrong? What did he, what did he really think? Um, and I guess, and I don't think, I don't think this is an insult to Aquinas to say. I, I mean, if you, is, is Van Beji, Beji, Beji? Yeah, I don't know either. Whatever, however, <laughs> right? Um, he has this really wonderful article um, that everybody should read, buried in some obscure book, that uh, called The Problem of Natural Virtue, right? And, and one of the super important things he points out in that book is he says that the notion that all the virtues, all Christian virtues, are d bestowed directly by God, he says, was medieval orthodoxy. Medieval orthodox, like that's a huge, and it's not something that the kind of growing up and reading your Aristotle and like, you know, I mean, it's not something you're kind of trained to think of. All virtue is a gift from God. Like you're just not trained to think that way. But I think we, we have to understand that's the tradition in which Aquinas is operating. Aquinas is already doing something huge, watershed, by seeing insights in Aristotle. And I, and I and we one wouldn't want to at all diminish the extent to which Aristotle informs Aquinas's writing. And I think Aquinas's genius is evident in in the way in which he takes the Aristotelian view of nature and brings it into the all virtue is a gift from God framework, right? Because he's he's unable to explain how grace fundamentally and thoroughly at the very root transforms nature. And so I guess I don't, I guess my thought, and of course, you know, like when you, a million years ago, you know, when I was writing my dissertation and was ignorant and thought I had all the answers and I wanted to say that like Aquinas really thought this or, he's, you know, but I'm not sure he was worried about how the infused and acquired virtues were related. I'm not sure that that question was really on his radar. The, um, the most explicit references, right, as Bill pointed out, are in this commentary on the sentences, right? Um, by the time you get to the Summa, it, it, it seems to change, right? Again, in one sentence, right, in, in this discussion of, but, but even his use of Macrobius changes, right? He uses Macrobius in the commentary on the sentences to make a point, um, and he, and he uses Macrobius in, in the Summa to, to make a different point, right? And the one seems to imply a kind of, what we've been calling separation of acquired, infused and acquired virtue in the sentences, seems to lean much, much more towards a unity in, uh, in the Summa. And, and then the only other remark you have is this kind of ambiguous comparison in a, the re, a reply to an objection in, um, Article 10 of the disputed question on the virtues in general. You, you just don't have much, right? And to me, that says Aquinas wasn't worried about this. You know, like we're worried about it. We're especially worried about it because of 
we're kind of inculcated in the notion of Aristotelian virtue, and we think of that being kind of what's fundamental, but I don't think it was fundamental for Aquinas. Um, so anyway, that's that's just a, that's a kind of non-answer to your question, I suppose. But um, I don't think it's any insult to Aquinas to to posit that perhaps this this question of the relationship, which is so burning for us and for the tradition of Thomas commentary, maybe wasn't a burning question for for Aquinas. Um, okay, so how radical is this? What what will it look like in practice? I mean, one thing that I kind of want to um, I don't, I don't think I'm really proposing anything that's all that radical. I, and here, here's why I don't think that, that I'm proposing something that's all that radical. Because when we act, we still use reason, we, we still d deliberate, we still try to figure out uh, what we should do, what the right thing to do would be. Um, if, <laughs> ideally in the Christian moral life, that reason would be being helped by the whole and prompted by the Holy Spirit, we don't know if that's happening, right? I mean, we, and to the extent we're sure that it's happening, it's probably not, right? I mean, so so we don't um, will will a life that is guided and prompted by the Holy Spirit culminate in rather different actions sometimes? Yes, I think it will. Will they? Will those actions sometimes be dramatically more aesthetic? Yes, I think they will. Um, but I, I think, I mean, one thing that I think is important is, and, and that we tend to forget is, is kind of our dramatic dependence on God at every step of the way, right? We're not just kind of autonomous and doing it ourselves. I think, I mean, I, I think of an example of this. Um, I, I always, I, you know, I lost my father a few years ago. I, I loved him deeply. He was a deeply holy man. And um, one, one, I just think of this as an example of the way that kind of the Holy Spirit can kind of transform our, our reasoning in non-obvious ways. Um, my, I have a brother who loves cars. He loves to buy new cars. My whole life, my brother's been buying cars. My dad's been like, you should save your money. You should save. And then, you know, and my, and my, my dad loves cars too, and my brother wants my dad to be excited. And I know, like, towards the end of my dad's life, one day my brother showed up with a, with a new car. <laughs> and, and my dad said, you take me for a ride. And my brother, he lit up, right? It was just like he made his year. And I said to my dad, yeah, I said, that was, I later, I said, that was, that was really nice. Did you, did you really like that car? And he said, no, but I, I knew, I, I knew that that was the response that I needed. But he, it, it was, and you can kind of see, I think you see Grace kind of transforming reason in that way, where it's not as if, Oh, grace is over here and reason is over here, but there's there's a fuller and better reason that we don't have access to when we're relying on our own powers and we're merely thinking about what's right, you know. So that, and so I guess that that goes, um, David, to the third thing that I wanted to say about the societal and political implications. Um, Michael Gorman, who's not here and who I've talked about these things, he's been so generous to listen to all of my ideas for 16 years or however long. You know, he, he uses this comparison that I really like. He talks about the difference between magnetic north and true north, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not as if mm -hmm. grace is pointing you here, right? The, 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 the divine justice is here and human justice is here. But it's like divine justice is here and human justice is like here, right? So there's an important sense in which... <laughs> I see David Cloutier in the back of the room shaking his head now. But, um, <laughs> but, it, it, but, but the, there's a way in which um, I, I think it would be a mistake to, to overstate the extent to which a theory like the one I like is going to put, say, mm -hmm. the political and the Christian at odds with each other. Because we, are, we do have reason. It was given to us as a good. We do pursue a genuine good. But the genuine good that we pursue is transformed, further, elevated, without being rejected, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're pursuing the good in, in, a, in a better, fuller, higher way without, um, without failing to pursue it at all. So I don't know if I, if I touched on everything, David, that you said, but I'll move, I'll move to Bill and his very generous comments. And I will say that, um, you know, Bill and I, I think we, we're in uh, David Solomon's virtue ethics That's class right. together back in 1997 yeah, or something, yeah, or 98 yeah. or whatever it was. Um, and, and it's just, it's, 
it really is such a gift to have a friend who works on the same things that you do and to just be able and not, I mean, I, if I write something, I want Bill to read it and, and it's just, it's, it's really a, a gift. And now, mm -hmm. David, I'm probably gonna send you stuff too. Yeah. Um, but, um, so Sorry. it really is, I really do, um, I'm so grateful for this conversation and I'm so grateful for, for Bill's comments. Um, but now. But now, <laughs> but now, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree, right? The, I call the te theological virtues seeds. Clearly, they're, you know, Aquinas also says they're virtue. They're not seeds in the same way. I, I mean, it's really, it's really interesting, right? Because in different places, he says, uh, when, when Aquinas draws that comparison, right, that the, that the habitual syndesis, right, the principles of the natural law, um, are, are the seeds of the acquired virtues. Um, and when he draws that comparison and, and says that the theological virtues are the seeds of the infused, he, he says, in some places he says in loco quorum, right? And in other places he says, um, so it's, it's either in place of or on top of, and it's not clear what he means, you know? So it's, it's, it's not at all definitive in the, in the text whether the theological virtues transform the, the trans, and, they, and of course they can't just trend. The comparison is between syndesis and faith, right? Because the right. knowledge of syndesis causes a desire for the will, right? And so synde, um, faith gives us knowledge of our supernatural end, and then we also need hope and love, which help us to desire and pursue are supernatural. So it's, it, I, I just, I'm just admitting that it's unclear and that it is, it is just a comparison. And I, I, I think you're right. Um, the nothing at all thing, I was looking, you saw, I was looking at yeah. this. I, I merely meant to make, I'm sure this is, um, I'm probably in for it now. I look, I do think that the acquisition of, of virtue helps in this way, right? It, it disposes you, right? You know, the virtuous pagan ha is preparing the matter for grace, I, I totally agree with that, right? And Aquinas says that, so I wouldn't want to attribute anything other than that to him. And, and clearly, to the extent that you don't have vices pulling you away, you're ordered to genuine goods, you're, you're more prepared for virtue. Has to be, has to be the case. In the context where I make the claim nothing at all, I'm responding to this notion that um, the, the person, this claim that's made by Inglis? Inglis, right, and others, that that if I have acquired virtue, I have almost everything I need, right, mm -hmm. for martyrdom, right? right? Mm -hmm. And and my point is that it's what what does it mean to have acquired courage? It means that I'm disposed to stand up for the good of human justice, right? And it seems perfectly plausible to me that I could have a very strong acquired disposition to stand up for the good of human justice and very weak faith, right? That I could have a very sp a small, weak inclination to be a martyr, right? And so t to me, the, the, mere, the nothing at all point that I wanted to make is that just because somebody has a lot of acquired courage and is good at, at kind of defending his country, maybe he, he could, you could easily have a very weak conception of the divine good, very minimal desire to stand up for it, right? Um, so I, I don't think that, Oh, but this guy, you know, he's he's won a purple heart defending his country. That tells me nothing at all about how good of a martyr he's going to be because it's a different desire, right? And I think Aquinas is clear that the desire to stand up for the good, um, for your faith, which is how what he describes the inclination of infused courage as, is different than the inclination to fight for your country. I think they are, they're different inclinations, and I'm not ready to say that just because you have the one, you have the other. So that was that was an, that was the nothing at all thing. Um, habits and dispositions, totally agree. There's a lot more to be done there. I'm yeah. not as you, I, I'm I'm not ready to get on the Madison train about the relationship <laughs> between habits and dispositions. I think I think there's interesting. I, I have a paper I want to write. I have views, um, but I, I, I'm just, you know me, I'm always a little more cautious, yes. right? You used to, Bill used to poke fun at me because I would never say anything in print because I was just like, yes. eh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, 
But I, I just, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I agree. That's, that's where, I think that's where we go next, right? I mean, that's where, what we need to do in this conversation is to talk about dispositions and habits and how they differ and how they contribute and what's carried over. Uh, I, I totally agree. Um, last thing, uh, the classification. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Please. I was like, I was on, I was on the Madison train that I had misclassified to Cosimo and okay. that he should have been up in the other thing. Okay. And I asked him, I was like, I'm afraid I got you wrong. And he was like, no, I think you're fine. But wait, so, so what, what is the, what, what puts About the there? classification of the view. No, but, but he still thinks they both exist, right? It's just that they operate But they're a, a, as a unity, right? So I was worried that I had classi classified him wrong because I thought that maybe he thought they sometimes acted separate from each other. Why did I, why, um, so you didn't think, I, you thought I should be with you and not a third option. Well, and I, I do agree that, I do agree I'm that. I'm saying we, there's two yeah, things, yeah, could yeah. them better or worse. Yeah, but, yeah. I, I guess what I, what I do want to insist, and I don't know if you think this or not, this may be someplace where we disagree. I do think that when we try to perform an act of infused virtue and fall short, as we invariably do, we end up performing acts ordered to a natural good. Observably or from the perspective mm. of the acting person? Um, actually. Like, I think so. So. It's <laughs> 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 like congressional testimony. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, I mean, so what, what are we doing when we try to act? Right? So I'm trying to lead a good Christian life, right? I'm trying to perform acts proportionate to <clears throat> supernatural beatitude. I'm reasoning about the good, right? I'm hoping that the Holy Spirit guides me. I'm hoping that I'm acting for the sake of my supernatural end. When, what happens when that fails? Well, I'm relying on my own reason and my own perception of the good. And so I, end up, I think I end up performing an act ordered to my natural good. Mm -hmm. And I think if that's an honest failure, meaning that I was really try, striving for the goal, I end up cultivating something that looks like a natural virtue, and I think it is dispositive mm -hmm. towards growth. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay. Looks like. Okay. I mean, yeah. <laughs> looks like. Yeah, observably. Uh, okay. Because you're narrating it as something else. All right. Yes. Okay. Even though poorly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you guys have just over about 10 minutes. Do you mind taking yeah, some questions? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Are there sorry, any, sorry. No, no, no. This is really good. But are there any questions people might have um, to them besides David? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know David absolutely has one, but... And if you want to go first, that's great. But you, you want to like take some questions from people? That's great. Yeah. So yes, I'm sorry. It was like involuntary party and Halawasian training, like mm -hmm. spilling up when you said true justice and natural justice were so close to one another. Um, but seriously, the the question that also came to me when I heard Angela's excellent exchange with David DiCosimo um, over at the Dominican House was. What is the work of the particular examples that are being used? So it strikes me that Angela, and, and to the extent I under, understand that it is in agreement with Bill's position, you draw on a lot of domestic analogies. So you use the St. Jose and Maria um, analogy about cooking when you were over at the Domestic uh, Institute mm -hmm. event. And the, 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 the family sphere, the marriage sphere, tends to generate the examples. De Cosimo is thinking about hmm. political matters. Hmm. Um, and he's also, he's not only thinking about things like the civil rights movement, but things like war, hmm. where it looks like there's this radical divergence, and that to say there's only one supernatural end seems to lead to pacifism or um, <coughs> some kind of political holiness out there. Right. Um, so the, the the question is really about what is the work of the particular um, material that you're focusing on when you're trying to understand acquired infused uh, relationship, and especially if the domestic versus political understanding matters. So I'll I'll say a very little bit. Maybe I'd be super interested to hear what you guys have to say. But I'm just going to contextualize a little bit. So a few what in a, a, a month ago, maybe a little over a month ago. Yeah, it was like a month. We had a, a, a conference at the Dominican House, and these this it issues um, same topic, different players. Um, but they, they, the I I offered Jose Maria Escriva has this beautiful little 
uh, aphorism or aphoristical description of somebody who, who's kind of living her Christian vocation to the full, right? And so it's not that she wasn't a Christian and became a Christian. It's that Christianity has kind of become more deeply rooted to her, in her. And he says, um, she's at, you know, she's, she's peeling, she's in the kitchen, she's peeling potatoes. And before, she merely peeled potatoes. And now she is sanctifying herself peeling potatoes. Right, so I, I use this as, a, as an example of like what really the, our goal as Christians ought to be, right, is even those most mundane acts must be acts of sanctification. Okay, so then in, in the very interesting discussion we had, right, um, there's this question of like, well, you couldn't really live a political life and think that every act was an act of sanctification because what happens when you go to war? Mm-hmm. And to which some of us said, <clears throat> Joan of Arc, Right, I mean, because which, right, which which, which led to which led to others to to become apop- apoplectic at the at the notion that an act going to war could ever be an act of infused virtue, and I just I want to say I mean I guess my my sense is that you cannot, and I I wouldn't want to attribute to any to to Aquinas and or to, I would want to think he left it behind in the sentences I wouldn't want to claim that the Christian moral life is supposed to be bifurcated, right? So that sometimes we leave our supernatural calling behind and go out and get our hands dirty. And then the rest of the, you know, then we go to church and we're holy. That doesn't sound Catholic to me. It sounds like something else, right? Um, So, but I'd be interested to hear your reactions to that. Oh, I was going to say just real quick, I think um, the reason why particularly individual and even domestic examples might be easier in making this point with due regard to the fact that justice exists in the household too, is Aquinas' claim about the rational mean being operative in virtues like temperance and courage as opposed to the real mean when you're dealing with interpersonal relations. In other words, it's tough, it's tougher to imagine how infused justice looks different than acquired mm-hmm. justice when you're dealing with relations between people. So I think, I think this is just to affirm that it, it, does, it is tougher. I, the reason why I asked Angela before about the perspective of the acting person is you know, the person marching on Washington for civil rights is in some ways doing something different from a faith perspective, like Cain, for instance, right, helping to inaugurate the kingdom of God than the person who's doing it for laudable secular motives, secular motives. So are they doing the same thing? Well, observably, yes, mm-hmm. right? But from the perspective of the acting person, no. And presumably that will lead to occasions where there will be also observable differences. Those differences are a lot easier to identify in the realm of temperance and eating, you know, with fasting and not, than they are in justice. So I, I have not adequately sorted through like a paradigmatic example. I don't think it's pacifism. I think if you, if you think that, you should be, you should be pacifist. If you think it's in, if war is incompatible with infused virtue, then Christians should be pacifists. So I don't think it is. So, um, but. Yeah, the only thing I briefly add is, a lot of people get misled by this because a lot of the time you seem to be doing the same thing. Aquinas talks yeah. about how they're differentiated exactly, and he'll say the matter of both acts is the same. And I've seen some scholars who should have known otherwise say something like, well, the act of missing my lunch and the act of fasting are the same act because I didn't eat any food. And that's just mistaken because he's very clear that the, the, the fundamental distinction is going to have to do with what he variously calls the mean the rule, whether it's the rule of human reason or divine law, uh, the measure, sometimes he uses that word. So it's going to come down to not just what I'm doing, but why I'm doing it and what's governing that. There are a couple of students here. Do you want? Oh, okay, yeah. So I just had a question, I guess, about like acquired versus infused virtues and like why is it that acquired virtues cannot be um, infused? virtues and like I guess more maybe what Aquinas had to possibly say on that. Yeah. No, it's, it's your book. <laughs> <laughs> turn to page. Um, yeah, turn to. So uh, acquired and infused virtues are the are differentiated by their ends, right? So acquired virtue is ordered to the fulfillment of your created human nature. And infused virtue is ordered to um, participation in the divine life, right? So um, the, the, the view is that grace transforms, elevates our nature, and makes possible a different kind of action, 
right? And so when we talk about our actions and what they're ordered to, um, Aquinas will use the language of proportionality, mm -hmm. right? So we can perform acts that are proportionate to our supernatural. And what does that mean? Well, um, it means, as, as David was just saying, that the, the end provides a kind of standard against which our action is measured. Okay, so if I want to act in accord with right reason, right reason is the standard against which I measure kind of my decisions about eating and drinking, say, right? And Aquinas claims repeatedly that there's a different measure, right? It's not just that like one, the, our good actions get, get another further end, but in fact, the, the different end governs our actions in a different way, right? So, so it's the act itself would have to differ, not just, oh, I did the same thing, but now I'm, it's, it's not just for right reason, but also for God. Doing it for God imposes a different mean on my action, right? So that, so that I'm acting differently if I'm acting merely for the sake of right reason or in a manner befitting my divine inheritance, right? And so, I can't just take the I can't just take a habit and tack a new end onto it. The entire habit is different, right? Because it's it's a disposition to perform different kinds of things. I don't know if any of you no, want to. Mm -hmm. Did you have something? I'm trying to answer um, Jeff's question about the I think I know what you're saying. You're saying that if I if I think that in the in the that we often are supposed to perform acts of infused virtue but fall short, what is what does that falling short look like? Is that what? Right. I mean, so I mean that's that's kind of what I was trying to get at with the example of of, of my father. I mean, I think any kind of I think sometimes the Holy Spirit if. I think, I think we ought to always be seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our actions, right? That we ought, always ought to be aware that our reason is not sufficient, right? That we shouldn't be leaning on our own understanding. Um, and I think that we can have, I think that it's almost in the, in the realizing where we, where we have fallen short that the examples come up, right? So if we've been insistent on a certain way of behavior because, or because we think it's the right thing to do, sometimes we have realizations that, no, this was in fact not, I was not acting rightly here, right? That I, I should have been merciful or I should have, I, I should have um, been a little more lenient or I should have, you know, I mean, it, there's a place where Aquinas talks about um, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and he says that um, one, of the, one of the ways that gift works is by making us feel mercy, right? So. I, I think we're always ideally reasoning about how we ought to act, but I think that, that the, the difference shows up in the times where the Holy Spirit prompts us and helps us to see that there, that there are different ways of acting. I don't know if I'm answering your question well enough. Mm -hmm. um, hi, I'm, I'm Ben Story. I teach political philosophy. Ah, okay. Yes, we know each other. The, uh, um, thank you for all this. The, uh, I have a question about a phrase that Bill Madison threw out of your book that was very striking to me. Portable mental firmness. <laughs> and you, you seem to want to reject portable mental firmness. Yes. And, but I mean, isn't this a thing? In the sense that you, know, that you, you see in somebody like, like St. Paul, that there's something that is common to his character on either side of his conversion, or somebody like Blaise Pascal, whose you know, the mathematical intensity of that mind is there on either side of his of his night, night of fire. So, what how, if that's if that's not portable mental firmness? How, how would you how would you give an account? No, I look. Yeah. I um I 
great question, great point. Um, I totally agree there's portable mental firmness. I just don't uh -huh. think it's virtue, right? I mean, so Eichmann, right, really responsible, organized guy. If he had converted, <laughs> he would have been a responsible, organized guy. But what irks me is when people call responsibility in organization virtues, yes. because they can clearly right. be put to the service of bad ends. That's right. People with portable mental, right, really strong people who are good at standing firm exist, and they make great Vikings, and they make great serial killers, and they make, right? I mean, so it, I just, I think that that's more at the level of a skill than, than at the, you know, I just, I, I get irked when people want to call that virtue, because okay. yeah. virtue cannot be used badly. Yes. And those kinds of things can be used badly. And I, can I just add, the a habit disposition thing? So yeah. what it would be, either supplied by nature or supplied by a customation in society, like a Viking land, it would be not a true habit, but a disposition, because mm -hmm. the specification of the action would not be supplied at the rational level with attention to the whole and connection to the last end. It would be kind of something that could end up like a blind horse running into things and used mm -hmm. poorly. Yeah. Which so. is a conversation that we'll have next year when yes. we yes. discuss yes. your book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Both okay. you it's up to you, Joe. Yeah, well, one more. One more sounds good. Or do them both together. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> a spousal question. At, at best, natural or acquired virtue disposes to infused virtue, uh, but is not sufficient or productive of that infused or supernatural virtue. So then, how can it be an impediment to infused or supernatural virtue? Doesn't that turn the gospel from good news into strange news? No, it, it only becomes an impediment, impediment when you've been invited to the kingdom of heaven and you want to stay with nature. Mm. Right? So when I'm called to martyrdom and I still want to keep defending my city, that's a problem. And I think it can be a problem. I, I, I don't think that we can deny that when I've been really good at pursuing the goods of this world, and for, for, the, for the goods that they are, those can, I mean, uh, I love Bernanos' Diary of the Country Priest, and I don't know if you remember the line where um, his, his kind of director or spiritual guy says, the prudence of this world can be the final imprudence when by slow degrees, uh, I forget the rest of the quote, but, right, but, um, but it, it's, it's a beautiful line, though, right? I mean, yeah, so I, you're right. It disposes, disposes, disposes. But if I want to stay there, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's the only point that I would make about that. That seems like a great place to end. Um, <laughs> at an unfinished Bernanos quote. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when by slow degrees it teaches man to do without God. Not that's the answer. Yeah, 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 you get it, right? Um, <laughs> I just want to thank the three of you. I mean, one of the things that we like to do with the institute is model scholarship. I mean, right? Like, I mean, that was just brilliant. I mean, don't, both in terms of the generosity, the specificity, you know, the pointedness of disagreement. It was a real gift to all of us to see the three of you guys, uh, you know, speak this way and engage each other's texts with such, you know, integrity. Um, so, really wonderful. Again, thank um, the three of them. Buy her book. Uh, it is everything they, they said, really. It's a wonderful entry, if you've not engaged this literature, into this, this important conversation. Uh, and we, we will have to do this again. I mean, yeah. it would be fun to yeah. do this again and mm -hmm. pick up some Twice of these threads. <laughs> so again, thank you all for coming. Yeah.